Okay, our next talk is uh, Noah Gibbs. He is the lead Rubyist at OnLive and the author of Rebuilding Rails. Um, he's a Bay Area local, lives, comes to us from Fremont, and he's been doing Ruby for seven or eight years now. So he's uh, pretty much an old timer now, right? <laughs> um, okay, so he's gonna be talking to us um, about building the littlest storm. So thank you, Noah. Thank you. Good to see folks. So um, somebody yell, slow the hell down every so often. I tend to go quicker when I get nervous. So when you get to the point, perfect. And next time I get fast enough, you can't hear me, same thing. That'd be great. So. Why build a note? Well, here. First off, uh, commercial announcement from, uh, from the folks I work for. Uh, like everybody else who hires Rubyists in the Bay Area, we're desperately trying to hire Rubyists. Um, both of you who are looking, please you know, remember that we're on the list of places that would love to hire you. Um, I'm also told, if it helps, that in addition to cloud gaming, we're redefining how applications are consumed on the internet. Also, it's Possible that the future is so bright you have to wear shades. I don't always get these lines right. Uh, but a lot of the problems we work on are really interesting. So uh, this is mostly chapter seven from my book. So you know that's that's where I get this material. It's where you could go for more of the material. We can talk about that a bit later. Um, so why build an ORM? It's not like there's a shortage of ORMs. There's uh, several out there. Active Record is pretty good, and uh, man, you wouldn't want to build that many lines of code. A lot of the reason is that all of these mappers work in a pretty similar way. And one of these days, you're going to wind up using Cassandra or MongoDB or you know, Redis or, or one of these others. And uh, something's going to be wrong with the mapper. I'm, I'm saddened to be the one to tell you this. Something's going to go wrong with the, uh, with the mapper uh, for at least one of those. And so you're going to wind up. I hope, seriously considering rewriting a better version for your specific use case. I don't mean that you have to make a, a big open source project. I don't mean you have to share it with everyone. I mean, you can decide whether even just to put in a pull request with the same one, which would be great, which would be wonderful. But something will go wrong at some point, and you're going to want to write a mapper. Uh, or you'll need to debug an ORM or a mapper. And it'll be awfully nice if you've gone in and built one when you want to debug. Uh, I'm not going to claim that this slide deck will prepare you to debug Active Record. Um, but it's still good. Uh, also, for each one of these, you'll find that there's multiple mappers. And the reason for that is that each one of those mappers gets one thing right. Uh, and you may need two things right at some point. <laughs> that means a pull request. And you may also. Uh, not just be working directly on MongoDB or Redis. You may want some kind of a structure. You may want to add migrations to one of these things. Um, I, I'm not going to speculate on you know, how exactly you want to keep people from getting down all the way to the, the raw low-level API, but I promise you sometimes that's a really good idea, and it's the same deal. You write a mapper. So that's why you would want to do this. Um, for those who want to follow the code directly as we go along, really, you don't have to. There's the GitHub URL for everything we go through. Everything we go through, by the way, will be the full code for a working ORM is going to be on these slides. If you typed really fast and just typed all of it as you went along, you would have a working ORM by the end of this talk. Um, that timer's not counting down. Eh. Either that or I'm already over time. So uh, you begin this the way you begin every gem. If you say bundle gem, gem name, um, doesn't have to be Git, but pick a source control system. Uh, add the SQLite 3 gem to your gem spec and bundle. Uh, now you've got an empty gem that does that. And I include this because, like I say, by the end you can have a working ORM. And I, I like to, to keep that true. This is what you have to do if you don't clone from GitHub. Uh, we're using SQLite, uh, as it says there, because it's the ultimate web scale database. It is so web scale that it's built into your browser, unless you use Firefox and are a freak. So you'll also need a table. I'm not going to go through the whole migration system. Um, so you don't get one of those. Uh, that one you could actually just steal from Padrino. Padrino does a great job of integrating several of those. Anyway, uh, SQLite will cheerfully create you a new blank database. And I'm going to assume that you have already created a table to work with. 
Uh, this is a mini blog thing. You'll notice that the body is only 128 characters long. I feel that Twitter does very poorly with the 140 character limit and with the power of two limit. You know, you can say things that are just much more profound for other programmers. You heard it here first. Um, you'll need to figure out the table name. When I say name there, name.downcase, that is using the name of the class. So if you inherit, say, a posts class from this model class, that means the table name will be posts. So if you remember here, what you do is you inherit a posts table exactly the way it works with active record, right? Your class posts inherits from, in this case, ORM model instead of active record base. Um, and I'm just using the downcase name of the table. Uh, you, it also takes a hash in the initialize function. So this, this code should look boring. Better yet, it should not look intimidating. My whole goal here is at the end when we've gone through this and you look at the code, you should be saying, that's an ORM? Really? I mean, there's, where, where's the magic part? If you're saying that at the end of the, uh, the talk, I'm doing great because it means you're not intimidated because it means that, you know, you would be happy to go off and write one of these. I will be a happy man if that's, uh, if that's where we wind up. This is a little more complicated. Uh, for SQLite in particular, there's a table info call. So where you see db.table info, that's returning a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the things it returns is the schema. And then we just go straight through that, iterate through, and it's basically a set of hashes. We grab the name, we grab the type, we put them in a hash. And that's just so that you have a hash that says body goes to varchar 128, title goes to varchar 32. It's just saying, here's your set of columns, here's what type they are. Um, So um, here's the first thing that's genuinely interesting that we're doing. I mean, it's, it's cool to be able to set up the classes. It's cool that it inherits. Uh, here's the first place where I can look at you with a straight face and say, yes, this is an object relational mapper. You're taking the relational database and you're doing something with it in Ruby. Uh, and once you get past the fact that there's a great big string at the top that I'm interpolating stuff into, the select your keys from your table where ID is equal to, to your ID, where that you know, builds the big string and then passes it off to SQL. Um, I'm sort of hoping that you know, when you've stared at this a second, you'll be bored by it too. That would be great. Uh, the only really interesting thing I'm doing here, because we're on a slide deck and all of the code has to be you know, a, relative, a, a very small number of lines, uh, is that that complicated looking line takes an array of values and an array of keys and it shuffles them together and puts them into a hash table. Uh, play with it in IRB. It's a great trick. I don't think Ruby people use this trick nearly enough. It's awesome. Uh, but it's not magic, you know? You're taking two arrays and shuffling them together into a hash table. Um, so we've just covered all of the incidental stuff, all of the like mapping to SQL, all of the SQLite-specific stuff. And the only thing left is, well, okay, what else does an object relational mapper do? And the answer is CRUD, create, update, delete. You know, you've seen it in Rails, you've seen it in Active Record. Um, and so to do that, you've got to create a row. Um, and if you look at this, this works exactly the way the last one did. You build a big SQL string, insert into your database name. Um, set of keys, set of values. You're going to see several different operations, one after the other, and they're all going to look like this. You know, they're all going to look like build a string, introduce the stuff. The biggest subtlety that you'll see in this slide is that I'm passing in the array of values there. Um, and I'm mapping a bunch of question marks. Uh, you should, I, I hope you won't have to do this for any of your various NoSQL interfaces because that just means that we're doing SQL escaping. And yeah, in addition to the, the array of question marks thing, uh, do you guys know that? Nod, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Do people know the, the cute thing where, where you escape SQL parameters by? I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, okay. Uh, the reason we do that is to avoid the little bobby tables thing. No laugh, somebody's heard of little bobby tables. The reason we do that is because otherwise somebody can pass in a bunch of SQL code and you insert it in the middle of your thing and it's, and it's all bad. Um, and I mention this because that's the only real complication SQL adds. Uh, if you're using a sane interface, if you're using you know, MongoDB, if you're using Redis, it probably already escapes all this stuff for you. Even the subtleties here go away. You know, the complicated stuff goes away if you use a better interface. Uh, so you've done the mapping. 
Um, here's how you can look up fields and that little internal hash, you may remember from initialize the, the at hash. Great, you know, they, they ask you for a name, you grab the name out of that hash table. They assign a name, they, you assign that name to, uh, to that hash table. So that's the first part of the, the real magic. You know, you can look an object up now, you can set fields in that object, and here's how you delete the object. So delete from table where ID equals that, and again, the to I is just for, for security reasons, uh, to, to keep them from passing something bad from that, for that, uh, to keep from passing in random SQL code. And then here we update the database row. And again, it's the same deal. Update table, set fields, where ID equals that. And it's, you're building an SQL string. All of this build an SQL string is the SQL interface. This is build a big string because unfortunately that's the SQL API. Uh, if this was the same thing, then you would just go through, iterate through the hash and for every one set this field equals this value with whatever your, uh, whatever your API is. And then I mentioned you insert a row into a table. Uh, you want to be able to create a new object and that means you insert a row into a table and then you find the object. And that's what you're looking at here. Um, insert values find new ID, that's the insert from before, that's the find from before. Uh, the one subtlety here is again another place where SQL is kind of stupid. Uh, it doesn't return you what you just created. Not only does my function not do that, SQL doesn't do that. They make you do that select last insert row ID, which looks kind of intimidating, but what it means is I just created something, can you please give me the ID like a sane language would have? Uh, so that's what we're doing there is we grab it out and we just find it again from the database. Uh, there are more efficient ways to do this, but if you can fit one on one slide, you're ahead of me. So, you know, take a breath. This feels like a lot of code when you're sitting here. You know, you've just sat through five or six slides worth of solid code. Thank you for that. Um, or 81 lines of code. The other way to look at it is a perfectly good, perfectly functional ORM just took 80 lines of code and none of them are complicated. So I've been talking about NoSQL throughout, but for the video later and for people reading the slide deck, all of this is about NoSQL. You know, yes, you could build another ORM. In fact, somebody should, you know, please. Um, but mostly what I want you to know is that you shouldn't be intimidated by any of this. The nice thing about Ruby is if you take the total, total line count of our frameworks, they're tiny. I mean, the, the guy who wrote Merb is in this room. Um, they're tiny. They're easy to read through. They're easy to write. They don't take you a long time to put together. They're not all this simple. This is clearly the first slide, ver, you know, for slides version, but not by much, you know? The real ones aren't a whole lot bigger than this. Uh, so don't be afraid of writing frameworks. Don't be afraid of, afraid of writing mappers. Don't be afraid of the Ruby magic because once you know what that does, there's not much to it. And incidentally, my entire book, you know, Rebuilding Rails, um, you, you build a Rails-like framework system by system from nothing. It's the same thing. All I'm really saying in every chapter of that is here's some piece of Ruby magic and it's just not complicated. You just shouldn't be afraid of it. What about tests? Uh, there's enough code on these slides, but if you do clone the GitHub, yeah, if you do clone the, uh, the GitHub URL, there are tests in there. So if you're actually interested in the ORM thing, um, that URL has links to these slides, it has links to the GitHub URL, it also has uh, the two chapters on ORMs from the book. So if you want to go through this a little more slowly with a, a little more uh, explication, um, Go there, there's a download link. That's, uh, that's two chapters from there. So, just to go over quickly, there's that URL again. Uh, I haven't tweeted that URL, though I have tweeted the, uh, the, the GitHub clone URL. Um, my team at OnLive is hiring. Uh, specifically, I mean, you'd be working for me. So now that you've heard me for a bit, you can decide, you know, how that is. And uh, the little comic pictures throughout are from Earthworld. Uh, I'm a big fan of web comics, and I'm really happy when people put stuff out under the Creative Commons. Sounds like an Earthworld fan out there. Uh, what I really want to say about it is if you're ever putting together a slideshow, all this is Creative Commons, so steal, steal, steal. Uh, but they're also cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So. Okay, so in, like I said earlier, in general, we're not doing Q&A at the end of sessions, but uh, Noah uh, just blasted through that material, <laughs> which I, so, so, yeah, slow down, man. You want to do it again? <laughs> we we oh, got quick. 15 minutes. I'm down to 14 right? minutes. <laughs> yeah. It's going to so, be a lightning talk at this rate. Right. Okay. So, I mean, we have so much time here that, uh, you know, we can do some questions if, uh, if people have questions for Noah. So. Do you? But don't get used to it. Um, hey, so for the one I haven't met today, Thomas, uh, work for Manhattan. Uh, I, in my experience, uh, a lot of ORMs are slowing down because uh, some of them are, you, you know, doing a bunch of uh, useless requests. So, would yes. you really recommend, you know, writing a bunch of ORMs? Uh, so, this will this will sound bad. I'm at a Ruby conference. Feel free to boo me on this. Uh, we're all writing Ruby here. If you are worried about absolute maximum performance, something's wrong. Um, in, in the end, it's absolutely true that your mapper will never, never reach the same speed as direct lowest level API calls on your interface. Just like your Ruby code will never match assembly language, just like any ORM will never match direct SQL. Absolutely true. So first, yeah, I want to acknowledge that. You're right. ORMs always add some amount of craft. Uh, Programmer time just keeps getting more and more expensive, and machine time just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper. An ORM that enforces useful constraints and keeps you from tripping over your feet, better yet, keeps someone else from tripping over your feet, is going to save a lot of expensive programming time at the expense of a lot of cheap machine time, is my primary answer to that. Hold, hold on. Sorry. Um, what, what I meant here was not uh, so much about the application time, but mostly about uh, doing useless uh, SQL, not SQL, but useless uh, request to database and overloading it. Uh, and then you have databases uh, issues, and that's, I, in my opinion, a bigger problem. Okay. Uh, I would argue that for a database that is reasonably scalable, it's the same thing. To some extent, you can track those down. You can keep your ORM from making useless requests in, in most cases. Uh, in this case, if you write the framework, you may have to fix stuff in the framework to do that, but you can do it, especially if you wrote the framework. A good framework should let you do that. I mean, um, and you can also just buy your way out of the problem. Useless requests overloading the database depend on the strength of the database, how, how much hardware you throw at the problem. Okay, um, one, more, one or two more questions. Hey, Wolf. Thanks, Noah. Great talk. Uh, could you give us your thoughts on uh, this is Wolf Arnold, by the way? Could you give us your thoughts on uh, relationship mapping in ORMs? That's where it gets juicy. And for me, having been been lost on Active Records uh, stack sometimes in uh, has many relationships or such, uh, are That's really right. interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. You're asking about uh, Active Record relations, and so in general about mapping objects to other objects. That is where it gets juicy. Not only is that where SQL can be very hard to optimize because you're doing a certain amount of trying to read the user's mind on what they're going to ask for next, um, in, in plus one queries, things like that. You know, it's interesting how a framework tries to answer the question, will you then ask for another item from this collection? Uh, it's also juicy because a lot of the NoSQL mappers actually make that kind of thing very difficult. Uh, they're, they're almost defined by not having a real join, right? Um, I believe that when you are writing your own framework, you've probably done it very specifically to your needs. And so to begin with, you should write a simple thing that works. And, and the second thing you should do is you should figure out which of those optimizations strongly matter to your problem and do just those. Because if you're writing your own framework, the biggest problem is having to maintain it. Well, really, right? Again, it's the whole expensive programmer time thing. And I'm, I'm suggesting you write a big custom piece of software. Than, than saying, oh, it's about expensive programmer time. I mean, that should look like a contradiction. Uh, and well, the reason it works is because you can write something just for your use case that is better than the general thing because the general thing hasn't caught up yet. Someday we will have a really good Active Record equivalent for Mongo, but it's going to take a while. Active Record took a while. The one for Mongo is going to take a while. Um, you can write something that's better for your use case, but then understand the advantage comes from just optimizing for your use case. So you have to understand your use case is a lot of what's going on. And sometimes you just have to hack around for relationships in particular, for bit between objects, for relational stuff on a, on a non-relational database. Very often you have to cheat. And if you know you have to cheat and you make your cheats look like cheats, usually that can keep the maintenance cost from growing beyond bounds. 
But the short answer is it's a hard problem and you're not going to write the best general solution. I mean, if you do, open source it, yay. Um, but uh, the odds are high that you're not going to write the ultimate generalizable solution. Cool. Uh, one more here. One more. Um, hey, uh, thanks for talking. When you have a um, ORM, like say you start off and you're writing it for MySQL or whatever your shop uses, yep. um, do, do you have any sort of sense of like if you want to move to Postgres, like what percentage of your kind of original uh, ORM is going to become uh, obsolete or, or, or rather that you're going to have to reinvent for Postgres? Um, I'm yeah. just wondering if ORM, like is Active Record just like a bucket of a bunch of little ORMs that just happen to have one label on it? Uh, so Active Record itself does have some of that. They, they, they have a large superstructure and then they have a whole set of type mappings that are database specific and adapters that are database specific. I mean, to some extent, the, the best advice I can give you is go read the Active Record source code and the object you're looking for is called an adapter. Um, there's a lot of shared stuff, but there's also a lot of database specific stuff. Uh, writing an ORM with multiple back, writing a mapper with multiple backends is a lot harder. Uh, what I said to him about the, you know, if you're building it yourself, do it specifically for your use case. The fewest backends you can possibly do will serve you the best. Uh, but with that said, yeah, look at the adapter object in Active Record for a, an answer to how somebody really seriously does it in production. All right, that, that, that's, uh, that's it for this session. Uh, we're going to give you a slightly longer break, so be back.